Good morning. Welcome to Redeemer Eastside's worship service. My name is Hector Sanchez, and I am an assistant pastor here at the church. We're so glad that you've decided to join us today for worship through our live stream. I want to especially welcome those of you who are worshiping with us for the first time. We're so pleased that you've joined us. We would be delighted to connect with you personally. You can simply email us at eastside at redeemer.com and a team member will follow up with you. For those who live in our area, we would love for you to join us in person on Sunday morning at our worship service at 10.30 a.m. in Temple Israel on East 75th Street near Park Avenue. We believe that something unique and transformative happens when we gather together in person for worship. And if you live outside of our area, please let us know if we might help connect you with a church near you. Our hope for you as you worship with us virtually is that you would experience the wonder and the welcome of God and that you would have a genuine encounter with a love that is far greater than we can ever imagine, the love of God in Jesus Christ. Welcome to worship.
Good morning. Welcome to Redeemer East Side. My name is Mary Cameron Taylor, and I am the youth ministry manager with our middle and high school students and families. And I am grateful to worship with you today. Just going to scoot this forward. There we go. Each week, our team prays for each of you that come into this space that you would encounter our living God, that you would walk away renewed by the gospel, by the good news that God loves you. Even if you are sitting in that seat and that is part of your weekly routine and you are confident and you're standing before God, or if you're sitting in that chair now feeling deeply unsettled and unsure what you think about God and religion, the Lord is delighted that you are here. I want to extend that welcome. Everything you'll need to follow along with the service will be on the screens in front of you, and you can follow along in the worship guide given to you at the door. Our call to worship today is from the Psalm 103, which is written by David, and it starts by, Oh, bless the Lord, O oh my soul, let all that is within me bless his holy name. And I want to pause there for a second and think about all that is within me. Every part of you is what God wants you to bring into worship. We are not meant to segment ourselves into this part is able to come before God and this part I'm going to leave at the door. But God cares deeply about each part of you, even the inmost parts of your soul. And he welcomes you to bring that before him today because he loves you. He doesn't want to judge you and condemn you, but he wants to invite you into his adventure and life with him. And so worship is a chance to do that and to practice that together. And so I invite you to stand as we do our call to worship from Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgives all your iniquity and heals all your diseases? Who redeems your life from the pit? Who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy? For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Defender, bring 
is a time we call the prayer of adoration, where we take time to tell God how we adore him. It's a time to posture our hearts before our beautiful God, who is our beloved maker, defender, redeemer, and friend. So I will open us in prayer and then give you some moments in silence to praise God where you are, and then we'll close together following the example Jesus taught us. So let's pray. O oh Lord, bless you. We worship you, our King, who is glorious and gracious. You, God, are holy and perfect, without blemish or shortcoming, and therefore we know that your love is faultless and whole, reaching unimaginable heights and depths. Lord, be with us now as we take moments of silence to praise you individually, adoring you for who you are and for your generous invitation for our whole selves to come and behold you. We praise you for your generous gift of forgiveness through Jesus. You are so good. What a gift it is to come before you now and forevermore. Now hear our silent prayers to you, O oh God. Lord, hear us as we pray the prayer that your Son taught us to pray, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. be seated. Our prayer of confession is another time to talk to God, this time about our need for him. See, God is holy and we are not. We are in deep need of God's mercy and forgiveness, but God knows that, and he promises to meet us each morning with the mercies we need for that day. He knows already what you're going to do that is acting against his will for your life, and he forgives that and offers you mercy in that. We come before a God who 
wants to know you and be with you and draw close with you, not a God who wants you to be ashamed or condemned. So today in our confession, we can come before God confidently, knowing that we are loved and accepted and that we are being renewed. Let us invite God into that, those areas of our lives that we see the need for renewal now. Together, we'll pray the prayer on your screen. O oh Lord, no day of our lives passes that does not prove us guilty in your sight. Our best services are filthy rags. All things in us call for our rejection. However, all things in Christ plead our acceptance. Grant us to hear your voice assuring us that by your wounds we are healed, that you were bruised for our iniquities, that you became sin for us, that we might be righteous in you. Grant that by resting in righteousness we may find hereafter walk in new and run hard after your commandments. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, amen. Please take these next moments to pray silently, asking God to meet you where you are. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Now for all those who put their trust in our Lord Jesus, hear now this assurance of pardon from 2 Corinthians 5.21. For our sake, God made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Please stand for our next hymn. Christ. 
Please be seated. This morning, we will be led in a prayer by Evie Mihalos, a member of Redeemer East Side who serves on our children's team as a CG leader and on our Sunday service team as an usher. So I'll invite her up now to pray specifically for God's impact through the Sunday service team today. Good morning, church. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for those you've raised and sent out to help relieve some of the suffering in our world. Thank you for the humanitarian aid sent to those caught in the conflicts between Ukraine and Russia and Israel and Gaza. We pray for your peace and justice. We pray for our city, Father, this city that you love and brought us to. God bless organizations caring for those in our communities experiencing housing insecurity, and for non-citizens searching for a new home. Father, may they encounter your hospitality here in a tangible way and find dignity through the complex legal processes they face. We lift up New Yorkers struggling with mental health, especially depression. May they know how precious they are in your sight. May you impart your wisdom and grace for the psychiatrists, psychologists, counselors, friends, and family who are coming alongside them in this journey. Father, we specifically thank you for our Sunday service team members at Redeemer East Side, for those who have served us faithfully for many years and those who continue to join. In particular, we thank you and pray for our youth volunteers. Thank you for working through them to show yourself to our community. As your beloved family in Christ, we pray that we would have such a personal walk with you that we would come not just to attend church, but would be planted here in our Father's house. May we use the gifts you first gave us to serve you for your glory and the good of your church. Let serving be a joy because of your love for us, and may we remember to first receive from you, because apart from you, we can do nothing. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for that prayer and for your faithfulness to our church. Now is our time of passing of the peace, so I invite you to stand. This is a time that we remember our identity as peacemakers in the world, seeking to bring the peace of God to all we encounter by meeting one another and doing the redeeming work of learning other people's names, asking curious questions, and sharing life with others. It's also a really good time to love our neighbors who are running late by scooting towards the center aisle. After passing of the peace, we invite our elementary students to go to their time of children's worship in small groups. You can meet your teachers out the back doors, both in the sanctuary and the balcony. And if you have a little one who's extra wiggly or really wants to keep singing, even though we're moving away from that right now, there's a chance for them to crawl around, get changed, and for you to not miss a beat in the service by going to the third floor to where we call the cry room. But let us pass the peace today from 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. You can read where it says all. Jesus bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness by his wounds, you have been healed. Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia. The peace of the Lord be always with you and also with you. Please turn and pass the peace. peace. How are you doing?
Welcome again to our worship service here at Redeemer East Side. Again, my name is Mary Cameron Taylor, and I want to extend an especially warm welcome to those of you who are new or visiting today. We have a special spot for you that we hope you'll come visit us at called the Info Hub, which is just outside these sanctuary doors and is covered with a bright orange tablecloth. We have stacked that table with people who are eager to learn your name, a bit of your story, connect you more deeply in the church through answering questions or telling you what's coming up, and to send you home with a gift. So please come visit us there. You also can fill out our digital connect card and read about what we have coming up in the church by scanning the QR code on the back of your worship guide. But today, I'm going to highlight a couple things coming up that we want on your radar. First, next week, we invite you all to join in the tangible action of serving our neighbors. Here at Redeemer East Side, we hope to be a church that is not for ourselves purely, but for the good of the neighborhood and the city. And so we ask you to consider what it looks like to be generous in what you have. Our neighbors at Redeemer East Harlem have a community closet that they offer twice a month that is a free, for anyone who needs it, secondhand store, and they give out household items and toys and clothing that are in new or excellent condition. So we invite you next week to bring your household items, toys, and clothing here, and we'll compile it all together, and we'll do the hard lifting of getting it to the space for you. This is a great way to love our neighbors and to give to those in need. And if you yourself find yourself needing practical items, please make use of this resource. It's offered the first and third Sundays of the month, 1.30 to 3.30, up in East Harlem. Next, we want all of you who are interested in knowing more about what it looks like to join God's work in the cultural renewal at your workplace to consider applying for the Gotham Fellowship. This is a really special program put on through the Center for Faith and Work where a cohort comes together for nine months to go deeper into theology and its practical implications, to partner with others in building spiritual practices and just going deeper and to dream as a group about what cultural renewal looks like in your work, in the city, and in your relationships, and how God has uniquely gifted you to participate in the work he is doing. So please follow your curiosity and apply for Gotham. Applications for this cohort close April 30th, so you have not that much time, so please get on that. Uh, That's it by way of announcements. I want to invite up Truly Ager to come read our scripture for today, followed by Reverend Rich McCaskill, who will give us a sermon based on that text. Today's scripture reading is from the book of John, chapter 14, verses 16 through 26. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Yet a little while and the world will see me no more, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. In that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words, and the word that you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. 
These things I have spoken to you while I am still with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, good morning, everyone. We come to our text today in the midst of some very difficult times. I don't know if you uh, are someone who reads the news or watches the news, or maybe both, but it does not take much reading to see that our world is falling apart at the seams. And to watch and to see the news and the stories, it's really heartbreaking. And so, There's a temptation there for us to come today to this text really in a state of despair, uh, really in a state of um, feeling like it's just just beyond hope. And yet, for us as Redeemer Eastside, there's also another, there's another component for how this passage strikes us, and that is that we are actually in a, a season of strong hope, that as a church, we are just about to experienced two wonderful things that we have been looking forward to for a long time. We have been praying for and searching for a new senior pastor, and we finally found a new senior pastor, thanks to the Pastoral Search Committee, and he is on his way here. In fact, he's going to be moving here with his family to New York City from the West Coast in just a month or two. In addition to that, we have been planning and fundraising for our new building for numbers and numbers of years. And we are about to move into that new phase as a church. In fact, probably by Christmas, we imagine that we will not be worshiping here at Temple Israel, but we will be worshiping at 91st and Lex in our own building with our own space that we have access to 24-7. A new way to to bless the community, to, to really love our neighbors, not just Sunday morning, but Saturday morning and Friday morning and Wednesday night and Tuesday night and So we come to this text with both a temptation to be in despair because it feels like the world is on fire and it's never going to be put back together. And we also, as Redeemer Eastside, we have a temptation to come to this text with pride, with apathy, with with a sense of, well, the troops have arrived, new senior pastors coming, buildings coming, I can just finally relax, you know? Finally, it's on them, right? New senior pastor, he's going to transform New York City. New building, it's going to transform New York City. (sighs) I I can stop worrying about my Christian life. And yet this passage comes to us and it confronts both of those. It confronts our hopelessness, but it also confronts our apathy. It confronts our pride. And it says to us that there is a solution for both of these. And the solution, according to Jesus, is the Holy Spirit. Now, for some of us, that that was really encouraging news. Oh, yes, the Holy Spirit. I've been waiting to learn about the Holy Spirit. I've, I've been studying the Holy Spirit. But for some of us, we're like, the Holy who? You can see this in our creeds. When we recite the Apostles' Creed, we talk about, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. We go on and on about God the Father Almighty. And in Jesus Christ, his only Son, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, died on the cross. We know so much about the Father. We know so much about the Spirit. And I'm sorry, about Jesus. And then we get to the Holy Spirit. And what do you hear? I believe in the Holy Spirit. This is God's great gift to us as his people. And yet for so many believers, he still remains a mystery. And so what we're doing is we're taking the next several weeks, we're going to look at passage after passage in the New Testament And we're going to recover this beautiful gift that is not just for some Christians, but it's actually for us. It's for all of us. I don't know what kind of environment you grew up in, but it's easy to think that, well, certain Christians, they are Holy Spirit Christians. The the ones who dance in the aisles, the one who bring their own tambourines, the one who are exuberant, they have emotions. You know, those are the Holy Spirit Christians, And then there's these other Christians, maybe more rational, more intellectual. Yet the Bible will have none of that. The Bible says, if you believe in Christ, guess what? You have the Spirit of Christ. If you have put your trust in the gospel, guess what? The Holy Spirit lives inside of you. You are now the temple of the Holy Spirit, according to the New Testament. 
It will have none of this dividing. And so let's embrace this good gift that God has given for us. And let's let it heal both our despair, but also our apathy and our tendency to pride. And let's hear this invitation that we are invited to be part of God's work in the city. It's not just the building's job. It's not just the senior pastor's job, but it's actually our calling too. It's our job too. And so as we look here at John chapter 14, we're going to see really three things. The nature of reality, the nature of God, and the nature of the Christian life. First of all, the nature of reality is that there are unseen things that are real, they are true, and they are powerful. According to the Bible, this is the nature of reality. The, the Enlightenment project has, in many ways, brought us wonderful gifts as a culture, as a society. And yet this is one of the downsides of the Enlightenment project, is trying to tell us that if you can't put it in a test tube, that it's not real. And yet there seems to be something in us that says, there's got to be more. There's got to be more. You can see this in our culture, in our exuberance around multiple things. You can see it in our exuberance around our sports teams. You can see it in our exuberance around wellness culture, or around politics, or around celebrity or fandom. You look at people who are really into these things, and it just seems like there's something more going on here than just just the human element. Have you ever seen that guy who paints his body and and he wears the horns and he goes and he just shouts for like three hours straight in the stadium. Have you seen that guy? Or maybe you are that guy. I mean, how how do you explain that? If you, even even the, the most eloquent sports player, even the most athletically skilled human, it, it does not equate one to one. Why why are they so over the top? Or some of our celebrity crushes There's even some celebrity musicians right now that people don't even care if they get into the show. They just go to the parking lot. They just enjoy it in the parking lot. Have you heard about this? Now, yes, the music is wonderful. Yes, but there's something unseen. There's something bigger going on here. It's actually worship. It's actually worship. Our our human souls were made to worship. And so the nature of reality, according to the Bible, is that there is an unseen realm. And that's what this passage teaches us as well. One of our um, interesting authors who has spoken to this is Tara Isabella Burton. She wrote a book called Strange Rights. Burton has written on religion and secularism for the National Geographic, Washington Post, New York Times. This is what Burton says. She says, we do not live in a godless world. Rather, we live in a profoundly anti-institutional one where the proliferation of internet, creative culture, and consumer capitalism have rendered us all simultaneously parishioner, high priest, and deity. America is not secular, but simply spiritually self-focused. She goes on to talk about how in our day and age, there is a proliferation of spiritualities, a hunger and a longing for the unseen. You can see this in the films that are out in the theaters right now. You look, you listen to the the plot lines. You see all kinds of unseen powers. You see prophecies being fulfilled. You see long-awaited messiahs. You see rituals. You see evil spirits. You see miracles. We cannot get away from the unseen. And this is what the Bible tells us. It says that there is an unseen realm. This is the nature of reality. J.R. Tolkien wrote a short essay called On Fairy Stories, where he tried to explain why this is so popular for us. Why can we never get away from fairy stories and fantasy? To the, to the great chagrin of many of our literary critics, we keep falling for these stories that have angels and elves and dwarves and all kinds of fantastical elements that everybody knows are not true. And yet Tolkien wrestles with it. He says, why are we so drawn to these stories? And he coins a word called eucatastrophe. Eucatastrophe is a sudden, happy turn in a story. You often see this in a fairy tale or in a fairy story. It's a sudden, happy turn in a story which pierces you with such a joy that it brings tears, Tolkien says. You can picture this in so many of the movies that we love. You can picture it when Rapunzel 
in the, in the movie Tangled, discovers that she is the long-lost princess. She's the one that the king and the queen have been searching for for all these years, and she finally has this realization, I'm wanted, I'm loved, I'm royalty. This is a catastrophe. And this is what Tolkien says. It says, in the catastrophe, we see in a brief vision that our longing may be greater. It is a far-off gleam or echo of the evangelium in the real world. For those of you who are Greek scholars, you know that the word evangelium, this is the word for gospel. Tolkien is saying that when we see these eucatastrophes in our fairy stories, what are we actually seeing? We're seeing traces, gleams, echoes of the gospel story, the supernaturally infused story of the gospel. That yes, this happened to Rapunzel, but actually it's also true for us that we are royalty that there's a king looking for us, who's who's seeking for us day in and day out. It is a far-off gleam, or as Tim Keller calls it, a memory trace, that you and I were made for more. We were made for more than just the physical world that you can put in a test tube. We were made for the unseen. Or as Shakespeare puts it in the mouth of Hamlet, there are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamt of, in your philosophy. So we see here the nature of reality, but we go further and we see the nature of God. God is one, according to the Bible. You hear this in the Shema, the the beautiful prayer that was recited over and over again in synagogues when Jesus was growing up from Deuteronomy 6. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. So this is the nature of God. He is unseen, and there is only one. There is only one God, the maker of heaven and earth. In a sea of false gods, there is only one true God. And yet the Bible goes further in the New Testament, and it tells us within the oneness of God, there is a mystery. There is a mystery of three equal persons. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. This is the nature of God, according to the New Testament. It doesn't have any qualms with this idea that there's only one true God. And yet it goes deeper into that reality and and begins to unfold for us. Within the one true God, there are three equal persons. What a mystery. This really wasn't understood until Jesus revealed it to his disciples and began to speak and act in such a way that he could not just be defined and described as a human. He began to speak and act in such a way that that his loyal Jewish followers began to scratch their heads and say, you're doing things that only the one true God can do. And it forced them to a, a crisis of belief. How can my worldview make sense of what I'm seeing and what I'm experiencing? One of the greatest things or the most controversial things that Jesus did was he would proclaim forgiveness of sins. And his opponents would get so angry and they would say, how can you do that? Only God can forgive sins. And Jesus would not disagree. And yet he would look at people and he would say, my dear son, my dear daughter, your sins are forgiven. Just a few nights ago, I I woke up early and I didn't want to get out of bed and I was, I was laying in my bed and I began to have these like memories of so many of the sins in my life, so many of the, the moments of guilt and shame. And this verse brought me so much peace that Jesus Christ would say, my son, your sins are forgiven. But can you see how this would bring a, a Jewish student to a crisis All of his early followers were strong Jewish men who had grown up in Jewish culture reading the Torah, and here is a man telling him that he can do what only God can do. And so they began to start to wrestle with this idea that within the one God, maybe there is a trinity. And when they look back at their scriptures, when they look back at Genesis and Exodus and Deuteronomy, they began to see clues that maybe this has always been the case. You look at Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. God says, let us make man in our image after our likeness. What's going on there? There's only one God. He's creating everything. And yet here we have in verse 26, let us make man in our image, in our likeness. 
Who is God speaking to? Another interesting place is Genesis 18. Genesis 18, it says, The Lord appeared to Abraham by the oaks of Mamre, and as he sat at the door of his tent in the heat of the day, he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, three men were standing in front of him. Whoa, whoa, wait a minute. It says the Lord appeared to him, and then it says he lifted up his eyes, and there were three men standing there. What's going on, Abraham? Verse 9, they, plural, they said to him, where is Sarah, your wife? And he says, she is in the tent. Verse 10, then the Lord said, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, will have a son. You see this mystery of it was the Lord, but it was these three men. But there was, it was they speaking, but it was the Lord speaking. There's a beautiful icon painted of this by um, Andrei Rublev in the 15th century in, in Russia. It's called The Hospitality of Abraham. And in this icon, you have the, the three visitors seated around the table, and they're wearing similar colors, but in a different way. So one has a blue sash, the other has a blue cloak. One has a gold sleeve, the other has a gold shirt. And you start to notice these, they're wearing the same things, and yet they're different. And all of their heads are tilted to each other as if to depict the Trinity worshiping, glorifying, honor, submitting to one another. And the most beautiful thing about the the Rublev icon is that it's painted at a four-sided table. You've got each of the three figures on either side, but facing the viewer is an opening at the table where there's a, a seat for the viewer. It's as if to say the Father and the Son and the Spirit are glorifying each other. They are, they are humbling each other and glorifying and praising each other. And they are inviting you and I to sit down and join in. In the middle of the table is a goblet. It looks like wine. It's almost like this picture of communion with the one true God mysteriously revealed in three persons saying, Come, sit with me, sit and eat. In John chapter 8, Jesus has this interesting dialogue with his opponents about Abraham, the one who saw these three figures. John 8, 39, they answered him, Abraham is our father. And Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would be doing the works Abraham did. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. And then this is what Jesus said. This is not what Abraham did. It's as if Jesus is remembering that meal in Genesis 18. He's like, Abraham welcomed me. Abraham cooked for me, and you're trying to kill me. They keep on going. Verse 56, he says, Your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. So the Jews said to Jesus, You are not yet 50 years old, and have you seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born, I am. So they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went away. The nature of God is that he is the one true God, and yet within the one true God is this perfect community of Father, Son, and Spirit, eternally loving each other, honoring each other, pouring wonder and joy and worship into each other, serving each other for all of eternity. And in the incarnation, we have God the Son taking on flesh. One of the members of this perfect community of love has now entered into our world. This is the nature of God. According to the New Testament, is that he existed for eternity in perfect love. And yet he was not satisfied to remain apart. But he came to welcome us into his love. And you see this in our passage, verse 16. Jesus says, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper. You see the members of the Trinity. Jesus the Son asking the Father, and then another helper. The Greek word here is parakletos. Parakletos, one who is called alongside it's used oftentimes in a courtroom setting where this is an advocate who's going who's to defend you and argue for you. Some translations call him the strengthener. And then look at what verse 16 says, that he will be with you forever. This is a promise Jesus makes to every Christian person. that the triune God has sent his spirit to be with you forever. 
It's hard for us to get our minds around this. It's, it's quite a mystery. But you can imagine the, the father being kind of in front of you. You're, you're trying to, to get close to him. And then you can imagine Jesus as like a brother, like next to you. And now he's telling us, you're going to have the Holy Spirit who is inside of you. And so the Christian life is not a life that we do on our own. It is a life empowered by God's very presence, his very self. Verse 17, he says, Even the Spirit of truth, the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him, you know him. Jesus is telling us that as Christians, we know the Holy Spirit, for he dwells with you and he will be in you. This is a hugely important preposition, in you. Christianity is a faith, an experiential faith, where God himself is inside of us. And then verse 18, it says, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Do you see the mystery of the Trinity here? Who is it that's coming to be with us? Verse 16, Jesus says that the Father will give you another helper. That's who's going to come and be with us. But then in verse 18, Jesus says, I will come to you. Wait a minute, which is it, Jesus? Is the helper coming to be with us, or are you coming to be with us? Jesus says, yes. Or in us, who's going to be in us? Verse 17, it's the Spirit who's going to be in us. He says, you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. But in verse 20, it's the Son who's going to be in us. Jesus says, in that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. The Spirit is coming to dwell in us. Jesus is coming to dwell in us. And then look at verse 23. Jesus answered him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him. And we will come to him and make our home with him. In verse 23, we see the Father and the Son coming to make their home inside of the Christian believer, to abide, to dwell you do not go to work as a Christian alone. You do not face your stress alone. You do not face your battle with sin alone. You do not face your selfishness or your apathy or your despair or your pride or your greed or your racism alone. The Father and the Son and the Spirit have chosen to make their home inside of you and that gives you an incredible, an incredible amount of hope that the things that you want different, that one day, by God's grace, they will be different. Do you see how this gives us hope for ourselves, but also hope for the entire world? Christopher Watkin has written a great book called Biblical Critical Theory, and he draws out some of the implications of the Trinity for our everyday life. The first implication is this. But if God is triune and he existed before the creation of the world, loving himself as Father, Son, and Spirit, glorifying and honoring each other for all eternity, if that's who God is, then that means that at primary place in the universe is love. That love precedes violence. You know, there are some worldviews that tell us that that's not where we came from. Reality is not grounded in a triune, loving Father, Son, and Spirit, but rather the worldview tells us that reality is grounded in, in randomness. It's grounded in the strong eating the weak. It's grounded in things like natural selection, red nature, red in tooth and claw. If this is where we come from, if, this is, if these are the roots of reality, then violence is primary. But if the gospel is true, that there is one God, eternally existent in three persons, then that tells us that love is primary. And that gives us so much hope for the world. It tells us that when we act in a loving way, there's a reason why that feels so right and natural. There's a reason why this fits us so well, why we go home feeling so good, because we are reflecting our creator. Love, not violence, is the foundation of all reality. This is what Watkins says. He said, It is only when we begin with a trinity that love, not violence, is primary and fundamental. He goes on, he says, Instead of a will to power, Christian Trinitarian theism has a will to charity. 
And this inscribed self-giving rather than the will to power is at the heart of reality. But in addition to this, Watkin shows us that the Trinity puts personalness, personalness into the fabric of our world. The biblical God then is one God in three persons, he writes, and that means that personalness itself is basic and relationship is part of the fabric of reality right from the beginning. Not task, but relationship. He says if personalness is irreducible and fundamental in the universe, then all persons have worth and dignity that cannot be taken away. You have a worth and a dignity that cannot be taken away because you've been made in the image of the triune God who himself is personal, who himself is love. Verse 18 describes this personalness. It describes this love in familial terms. See this in verse 18. He says, I will not leave you as orphans. It's not just a a generic love, but it is the love of a father to a child, the, the, the adoptive love of a father to a child. I don't know if you've ever adopted a child, but there is a cost involved, and there is always a desire involved. I wanted this child. I'm willing to pay the price for this child, and Jesus is telling us this is how God sees you. He wants to be your perfect father. He wants you, and he wants to pay the price for you. I think a beautiful example of this is Marjorie Elliott. Marjorie Elliott, since 1993, has been hosting a weekly free jazz concert in her apartment. I don't know if you've ever been, but she and her son, Rudel Dreers, have decided that they want to bless their neighbors and bless their community, and so every week they host live jazz. This is what she said. She said, we are excited to use our apartment because we can do what we want here. I almost hear God saying, I'm excited to adopt these humans into my family, to love them perfectly as a father because I can do whatever I want. I'm the God of the universe. But while people are there, they are enfolded in Marjorie's family. She looks at them and she says, you are my family. And in fact, one point she stood up at the interview that I read and she looked at everybody and she said, you are my family and this is where I applaud you. But at the end of Marjorie's beautiful jazz concert, everybody leaves. Everybody goes home. But in the gospel of Jesus, the Father and the Son and the Spirit, they make up a bed. And they say, you don't have to leave. I want want to keep this going forever. This, according to the gospel, is the nature of God. That he, God is love. So lastly, this shows us the nature of the Christian life. What is the nature of the Christian life? Verse 21, he says, Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. He who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. What is the nature of the Christian life? Well, we've already heard the nature of God. The nature of the Christian life is love. It is active love love, self-giving, self-sacrificing love for others. I was listening to an interview from the Noy Gallery. It's just up here on the Upper East Side. They have some amazing uh, landscapes on display right now from Klimt, one of the most famous Viennese painters, as well as Women in Gold. And the, the founder of the Noy Gallery was saying in the interview, he said, all my life I had dreamed of displaying these works of art. And so I went about collecting them, researching them, finding them, paying for them, and now displaying them. And I just thought, what a picture this is of the gospel, is that God goes out into the world, and he looks for us, and he want, and He pays the price for us so that he can bring us to himself. But I think the difference between the Christian gospel and the Noi gallery is that God doesn't just try to keep us all in one place. Actually, this is wonderful that we do this every Sunday, but God's, God's dream, God's heart, his hope, is to send us out into the city that he loves, to send us out into the world that he loves, into the different workplaces, the different apartment buildings, the different parks, the different neighborhoods, because we are his works of art. But what does he want us to be doing while we're out there? It's right here, to live a life of love, a life that feels his love, and then a life that loves others. 
See, John is very clear that it all begins with God himself. The God is love. And that God loved us first. If you remember earlier in his gospel, chapter 3, it says, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Later in chapter 16, Jesus says, The Father himself loves you. And then in verse, chapter 15, verse 9, he says, As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now abide in my love. This is the nature of the Christian life. That the triune God who has forever been loving is now loving on us. And he sends us out to love our neighbor. Jesus tells them, he says, This is the new commandment that I give you that you would love one another as I have loved you. So you are to love one another. The famous French general Napoleon said this, Alexander, Caesar, Charlemagne, and I have founded empires, but on what did we rest the creations of our genius? Upon force. Jesus Christ founded his empire upon love, and at this hour millions of men would die for him. This is the nature of the Christian life, is that you and I would experience God's love by the power of his Holy Spirit. And do you see how this gives us hope? Our world is so filled with tribalism and racism and international conflict. What would happen if we were filled with the love of God? There's a beautiful example of this in an organization called Musalaha. Musalaha was started years ago in 1990 by Dr. Salim Munayar, who's a Palestinian Christian and citizen of Jerusalem. Musalaha brings together Palestinians and Israelis, and they take them into the desert in Jordan to work together on reconciliation. They commit to journeying together in relationship for an entire year, but they begin in the desert. And this is what Dr. Munayar says. He says, Christ has liberated us from sin. Christ has liberated us from racism, from prejudice, from hatred, in order that we form a community in the desert. In the desert, we cannot play games. There is no makeup. We have to help each other, and we are on neutral ground. Your enemy becomes the source of your survival. And we remember that our destiny and our neighbor's destiny that they are wrapped up together. The gospel of love, breaking down even the most difficult and most painful barriers. And should we be surprised? Because God himself is love. But it's not just over there. It's not just in the desert of Jordan. You can see it even here in our own church. On Easter, We took up an Easter sacrificial offering to give out to Hope for New York, to give out to affiliates who are serving the poor and the marginalized. And Redeemer Presbyterian donated over $520,000 on one Sunday. Live a life of love. Guess what, friends? You are living a life of love. So that's the nature of the Christian life. Essentially, it's telling us to work on our abs. Abs, ABS. You can see abs in two ways. Always be striving, trying to prove yourself, trying to earn affection, or always be settled, remembering that you have been loved with a perfect eternal love. The gospel tells us to focus on always being settled. So if you're a Christian today and you already know the love of God, this is the invitation to live a life of love, to follow Jesus' command by the power of the Holy Spirit, to love others the way Christ has loved you. And if you're a non-Christian today, maybe you're hearing about God's radical love for the first time, this is your step to let him love you first. Let him love you first. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you that when we were far from you, Lord, when we were your enemies, that you came after us. And God, we ask for help to understand what it means to be filled with your Spirit. And Lord, as we spend these next several weeks learning about your Spirit, studying your Spirit, Lord, 
Open us up to be a people who love others the way you have loved us. Lord, we pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. After receiving God's word for us, we come to the time of the offering, which is an opportunity to respond to that gospel invitation to abide in God's love and to consider what trusting God with our whole lives, even the inmost being of ourselves, means. See, God wants to develop us. He wants to develop our trust in him and develop our joy through our participating in the work he is doing. And he empowers us with his spirit to do so. It's not about us easing a guilty conscience or checking boxes or just thoughtlessly giving what's left over, but trusting God and actively participating in his love and growing in likeness to him through it. So during this time, we'll have offering baskets come around where you can contribute financially to the work Redeemer Eastside is doing to share the love of Jesus in this city. You can also donate online, and we encourage setting up recurring giving to be in a rhythm of sacrifice and trust. But we hope you'll take this time to consider God's invitation for you today. You are so loved. Let us pray together as we prepare for the offering. Mighty King, guide us to follow your example of love and community. May all that we give today, whether it be finances or time or love, whatever it is, Lord, lead us to do so for your glory. Allow all that is offered to further your mission in this church that we may show your love to our neighbors, our city, and the world. Thank you for entrusting us and giving us wisdom on how to use what you've given us for the good of the world. Lord, in your mighty and all-loving name we pray. Amen.
a few reminders before our benediction. We have an important meeting today, our congregational meeting, that we invite all of you to join, but particularly need members to join, as you will have the responsibility of voting for our deacon, deaconess, elder, and board of trustee candidates. So please promptly make your way down to the sanctuary following the service, as we'll start that meeting immediately. Uh, parents know that your kids are good to go upstairs. They'll take extra time with your kids any day. So feel free to join the meeting and, again, come quickly. Another note is we have a survey out. As Rich said, we have exciting things we're looking ahead for. Our senior pastor coming this summer and moving into our new building in the winter. And we crave and value your feedback because we want to make decisions for the good of our church. So please, please take time to fill that survey out. You can find a link through the QR code on your worship guide. And while you wait for the congregational meeting, it's a great time to fill that out. It only takes a few minutes. Lastly, I know many of you in this room are struggling. You are going through a hard season, be it financial stress, relationship, brokenness, struggling with doubts in God or wrestling with faith or just experiencing great loneliness or depression. And we want you to know you're not alone. And we want to walk alongside you through this season. So we have trained leaders, deacons and deaconesses, who will be up front by the stage and just outside the doors of the balcony, who are eager to meet you, listen to what you're going through, and pray with and walk alongside you through what you're facing. So please take advantage of those relationships. They'll be wearing red badges so you can recognize who to go to. Uh, there's also a care line and form that you can find information on through our web page that you can access this team at any point during the week. But please know we want to be a community that cares for one another. So let us now invite Rich McCaskill up to give us our benediction. Will you lift your heads, please, for the good word? Now may the perfect love of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit free you from your fears. May it catapult you into your calling, and may it fill you with love for New York City and for the people that you are closest to. Amen. Amen. Let us go forth to serve the world as those who love our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.